Like most people, throughout your life, you have been bombarded and convinced by advertisements, that you were not born with enough light inside of you. Convinced, that what light you were born with, was lost, after childhood, through the negative elements, and experiences, of early adulthood. Often, when you sit on bathroom floors, you can feel a darkness, growing inside of you. A darkness, that dims your natural lightness. Even though, the lightness feels dimmer, it never truly dims. All of the light you were ever born with, is still on, is still inside of you. All of the light is inside, and still bright. But still, like many people, you become jealous of plants, and the natural ability of plants to absorb sunlight. And like many people, you spend your days, hunting plants. Then, capturing and eating the plants, with the hope that you will, absorb the sunlight within the leaves and stems of the plants. Thinking your actions are a way, to transfer and then, again carry light within your body. In a temporary way, this works. It causes you to feel light, and full of light, after consuming plant bodies. However, you must continue to eat plants, their leaves, roots, and stems, for the rest of your life. Until one day, like today, a day in which you have exhausted yourself, with the hunting and eating of many plants. You feel tired, even with all of the plants inside of you. And through ways that science cannot explain, the plants inside of you, communicate and convince you of their light. The plants then begin to show you, another source of light. A source of light, you can access at any time. All you need to do, is close your eyes, and focus on the darkness, until you see small tips of light, like stars, or flecks of glitter, poke out from the darkness under your eyelids. Now, focus on those tips of light, and move toward them until the small tips of light, will become large points of light. They will become crystals, filled with light. Crystals, that are already inside of you. Crystals, that are waiting. Crystals, that hum to you, with brightness and a song, that science has yet to explain. A song that begins, with the words, now, you are asleep, and ready for another dream. With your dream guide, friend. This is the crystal dream. We begin, in the season of smoke. The season when the trees are too dry, and magma boils up, through the crust of the earth, to spill out onto the ground, under our feet. Magma, that tries to rise up, and melt our shoes, and the roads we walk on, as we walk on them. In the season of smoke, everything in the world is smoldering. That is, everything in the world, is full of barely suppressed emotion. In dreams, emotion erupts out of the world, in the form of steam, and smoke. A collective, emission, of emotion, filled with dark particles, and dust, and skin. An emission, that floats up into the atmosphere, creating a cloud blanket, around the dream earth. A cloud blanket, which does not warm, but instead smothers the dream earth with coldness. 
because light from the dream sun cannot reach the surface of the dream earth. Many scientists take breaks from their own personal research projects to study the season of smoke. To understand why every object, individual, and location in the world chooses to release emotions in the form of carbon and particles at the same time, in the same way. We are such scientists and we have taken a break from our research on the causes and consequences of lakes. That is, we have spent months sleeping in tents beside lakes. And then, after waking from sleep beside lakes, we ask each other questions about lakes. Questions like, what happens inside the stomach of a lake when that lake sees another lake they think is very beautiful? Since lakes do not have butterflies to swim within them, do frogs or alligators appear inside the lake stomach? Or do people appear inside the lake stomach? Maybe people who swim deep and without snorkels. And if it is any assortment of animals, does the lake arrange for those animals to swim inside their stomach? Is the purpose of life on land to work jobs and wait for a lake to issue a call for animals to swim within them when the lake is ready to fall in love? And really, where is the stomach of a lake? We are full of questions about lakes. Our research so far involves asking questions about lakes. Perhaps, in the future, our research will provide answers to our questions. Perhaps, in the future, we will be able to communicate with lakes and then ask our questions to receive lake answers. At this moment, however, in the present, we study the season of smoke. We walk on stilts because the ground is very hot. There is lava under the ground beneath our feet. There is lava under the ground that causes the ground to smoke and boil. Lava that we do not want to touch. The air is full of dark particles and dust and skin and smoke of emotion. We walk on stilts to walk through the smoke, to study its composition and meaning, and then you see a flicker of pink move under leaves on the ground. You ask me if I saw the pink movement. I tell you that I did not see a movement of pink or green or gray. I point to the sky and say, I do see a lot of blue migrating back to the sky, above our heads, because the smoke is thinning here. You point at the leaves and say, I see the pink again. And then you ask, if the pink could be a crystal. And then you ask, what powers are associated with pink crystals? Because like many people, you want to feel light and a light inside of you. Because like many people, in dreams, you know crystals are a good way to achieve this feeling. I tell you, pink crystals are often associated with regulating a healthy blood level. Sometimes or very often in dreams, the sun appears, and when the sun appears, the sun wants to know about everything that is happening upon the surface of the earth. Then the sun wants to know about everything that is happening underneath the surface of the earth. The sun is the most curious being in the sky. And when the sun gets really curious, the sun tries to look deeper into things. The sun has no problem with opening up a mountain and looking inside of it. The sun has no problem opening up anything on the surface of the earth to look inside even if the something is a mountain a sewer or a person the sun cannot see a person 
without trying to look inside of the person. The son will often try to use knives to see inside of a person if a magnifying glass will not work. When the son uses a knife, blood loss is sure to occur. A person holding a pink crystal has a better chance to restore their spilled blood supply than a person not holding a pink crystal. Though you can continue to live without blood in a dream, you will not be able to move very fast, which may cause you to lose a job and the job hat you are wearing because your dream boss will give your job hat to someone else. Someone else who can do the job you are too slow to do with your blood loss and earn the right to wear the hat. But then, I tell you, that sometimes or very often, in dreams flowers are not typically stationary agents. Flowers wear many hats, and when I say many hats I refer to both the figurative and real meaning of flowers wearing many hats. Because flowers work many jobs, and many of those jobs require flowers to wear hats different from their original flower hats, which are the hats that most people, when people see flowers, see the flowers wear. The hats that are the reason why flowers are named flowers. I tell you that sometimes or very often, in dreams what looks like a flower, wearing a flower hat, is not a flower, but is instead a caterpillar wearing a flower hat. Why caterpillars wear flower hats is unknown. No scientist has successfully dressed as a caterpillar in order to infiltrate the society of caterpillars to learn their language and customs. The one thing that is known about caterpillars is that caterpillars are very aware of when a scientist attempts to dress as a caterpillar in order to infiltrate the society of caterpillars. You move the leaves and reveal a caterpillar wearing a flower hat. The caterpillar freezes and acts like a flower in the real world. However, if it were acting like a flower in the dream world, the caterpillar would know to run away or take off their flower hat to prevent being picked and placed upon the lapel. You pick up the caterpillar, wearing a flower hat, but do not place it upon your lapel. You want to ask the caterpillar if they know where any crystals are located. But the caterpillar does not give you time to ask your question. The caterpillar spins a cocoon in the palm of your hand. A cocoon that wraps around your hand and fingers until your hand and fingers are covered by a cocoon. This event that is happening to you is rare even inside of dreams. Rare because in dreams your edges and shape usually never changes. Because in dreams you appear as the most you version of you that is possible. In the waking world, you must wear disguises and eat various diets to try and reach the most you version of you that is possible. You ask me, what does this mean for my hand to now be inside of a cocoon? And I tell you that we will need to search for a cocoon scientist to ask about your hand and the shape of you. But then I realize, it is still the season of smoke, and all of the cocoon scientists are more than likely researching smoke and particles in the air. And I tell you, that we might instead need to search for a library. I pull out a silver crystal from my inventory pocket. The silver crystal is the information crystal. Ask the silver crystal any question 
where sunlight is available, and the crystal will lead you to an answer. We look up, for a clear patch of sky, through the smoke that hangs like a hill of bad luck above us, and look for the sun. We see a thinning spot in the sky, a spot where the sun squeezes through the clouds to see us on the ground. I hold the silver crystal up to the sun, where it shines in through the smoke in the sky, and ask, Silver crystal, can you help us find a cocoon scientist, or library, or anyone who can help us restore the shape of a hand? A hand that belongs to my friend, the dreamer. The silver crystal drops from my hand, and shivers on the ground. We wait for the sunlight, to fuel the crystal. Because here, all crystals need sunlight to operate, though it is rumored there are crystals with internal suns, that shine and help operate other crystals. I have yet to witness one. Because of the season of smoke, and the particles and carbon, and bad dance songs, in the air, we wait, a long time for the crystal to charge. We stand such a long time in place, that the heat and magma of the earth, melts the ends of our stilts. And we feel ourselves, falling slowly to the ground, down to the heat of the earth down to possibly burn up and become a part of the smoke that makes up the season of smoke we begin to pace and walk in circles to keep our stilled legs from melting as scientists we should have known better than to buy aluminum stilt legs you pull out your scientific observation notebook from your inventory pocket and you make a note, that next season, we should purchase stilled legs that will not melt. The silver crystal, which is not bothered by the heat of the earth, begins to shiver again, letting us know it is fully charged. The crystal moves, and we follow the crystal, as it snakes along the ground, down a path, through a stand, of smoldering trees over a dry creek bed behind a 24-hour hobby super center into the cave where no one remembers to bring a flashlight then out of the cave to a field then the crystal stops beside a boulder beside the field but the boulder is not a real boulder the boulder is an observation boulder. I show you the latch, that opens the boulder. We open the boulder, and inside, we see a scientist sitting on a stool, and looking out a window, through binoculars. The scientist turns to us at the door, and says, Excuse me, this observational boulder is occupied, if you would have observed the sign-in sheet, on the clipboard, Hanging outside, you would see that this observational boulder is reserved for the day. The scientist continues to hold the binoculars to his eyes as he looks at us. You look at the sign-in sheet on the clipboard hanging from a nail on the observational boulder and see a signature and that the day is reserved for the scientist. You say, we are sorry, a silver crystal led us here. The scientist says to you, a silver crystal led you here, then you must need information. However, I am gathering data, and observations, of people in the field, during the season of smoke, to see if their wander patterns, are affected. We look out of the window of the boulder and see many people walking around, holding pieces of paper in their hands. The scientist says, I have handed each subject a treasure map. This is to get the subjects walking, but then I erase the map, while they are looking at it. 
to see if the subject will continue to walk, in the last direction the treasure map indicated for them to walk toward. The scientist turns back to the window, and then says, See how subject 34 has stopped walking, this means I need to draw him a new map. And the scientist pulls out a clipboard, with a piece of paper on it, and then the scientist, pulls out a blue crystal. The scientist, draws a series of curved lines, and geographical markers, and a giant X symbol, on the paper with the blue crystal. The scientist tells us, the paper is related to the paper in the hand of the subject. The blue crystal transmits knowledge from one page to the other, because they are related, and because they speak the same, paper language. Then the scientist tells us, sometimes, or very often, a subject, when they are walking around, with a blank paper map in front of them, will continue to walk, and then wander, until the map returns. A person, in normal conditions, outside of the season of smoke, will naturally wander and walk, counterclockwise. However, the scientist says, during the season of smoke, people tend to walk, in ways that cannot be related to clock movements. The scientist says, I will need the entire day to observe, and then discover why. You tell the scientist, about the cocoon on your hand, and then hold up your hand, which is now covered by a cocoon, the size of a basketball. The scientist tells you, that they are unfamiliar with cocoons. Because, cocoons are not in their field of study, the scientist points to the window of the boulder and tells you, that people are in this field of study. The scientist hands you their binoculars, and you hold them with your cocoon, free hand, and look out to people wandering around, holding maps, in the scientist's field of study. You see a man, holding a map in front of his face. As he walks, you see a tiny red dot, move along the curved path of lines on the map. When the man takes a wrong step, the tiny red dot, drifts away from the curved path of lines on the map. The man adjusts his walking path, to position the tiny red dot, on the lines of the map. You use the binoculars to focus upon the map. To see the path, the landmarks, the X where the treasure is found. You focus upon the map, and then the tiny red dot, which falls off the path, of lines. And into the empty space of the page. You focus on the red dot, and it looks closer to you. You feel your legs moving, and that is because your legs are moving. You are walking, through the scientist's field of study. You are holding the map, in front of you, with your cocoon free hand. You are surrounded by smoke. You look around, to see the observational boulder. But there is too much smoke, and too much distance between where you stand, and the horizon. You look at the map, and the lines leading to the position of the treasure change. You know somewhere, the scientist is using the blue crystal, on a relative to the piece of paper you hold. To draw a new treasure map. You begin walking, and when you walk, a tiny red dot appears. You hold the paper to your face to see that the red dot is actually a tiny sliver of a red crystal. Because, in dreams red crystals are mimicking crystals. Red crystals will mimic the movements of whoever is closest to them. If you were to jump up, a red crystal would jump up as well. So you jump up, at this very moment, and the sliver of red crystal jumps up from the page. You begin walking, following the position of the red sliver of crystal, 
moving on the map page. A map page, with a path that is always changing, and moving. So many times, that you must stop and orientate your position, so the red crystal will orientate its position, to follow the new direction of the path, on the map. A path on the map, that leads you out of the scientist's field of observation, into a gathering of trees, and then out of the trees, and over a dry creek bed, then into a hobby warehouse, a place where many people visit, to find new hobbies, when their old hobbies, have outgrown them, or turned to smoke, in the season of smoke, and migrated away. You walk down an aisle of the hobby warehouse, where a man, sitting at a table, asks you to find his waiter, because he has been waiting months for a glass of water. And then down another aisle of the hobby warehouse, where, many hobbies call out for you, to take them home, and make them your new hobby. The loudest of these hobbies were the hobby of being afraid, of falling out of a tree, because you climbed up a tree, on a windy day, and tornado sirens, begin to siren, in the distance. And hobby of not sleeping at night, because you listen for the front door to unlock. Because, you are unsure of who else, might have a key for the lock. Because, you do not know how many keys, to your front door, are circulating around the world. Because, one time, you went to a store, to make a key. In the hardware section, you found a device with many key design options. You picked the key, to be shaped like a fish. Because, you had a friend, a friend, you met at the ocean, and you wanted your friend, to remember you met at the ocean. And thought the fish key, would be a nice way to remember meeting. And this is a friend, you want to visit you, while you are asleep. A friend, that can open your door, at night, and borrow anything they needed. Maybe food. Maybe clothes. Maybe movies. Maybe even your face. A friend, that could borrow anything, so long as they return the item, before you need to wake for work. Outside of the hobby warehouse, you continue to follow, the changing map lines, on the map, away from the hobby warehouse, beyond a loitering of trees, a merger of crows, and ravens, beyond a mouth of stalactites, and stalagmites, into a catacomb of skulls, and along the torch-lit tunnels, of the catacombs, until you reach a door, and you look at the map, and the sliver of red crystal, sits on top of an X. You have found a treasure. You ask yourself, to the inside you. The you, that sits inside your brain. Is the door, the treasure. But then, the inside you. The you, that is now standing, with hands on hips, says to you. The treasure, is behind the door. So you listen to the you inside of your brain and open the door with your cocoon free hand often in dreams doors are places of great power because in dreams doors represent death and transformation the death of the you outside of a door the transformation of the you through the other side of a door one should never stand in a door way too long in dreams while door frames are safe places, to stand when experiencing an earthquake in the waking world. In dreams, door frames are places of danger. A door, without regard to your preference, could push you out of your transformation, or into it, depending on how the door feels. Always remember, a door is wild, with what a door does. On the other side of the door, 
you see a great cavern, which is also a library. There are shelves, there are ladders, there are floors, there are rooms. But the library is not a library for books. You see a library of crystals. Every type of crystal in the dream world is here, to be used for reference, or pleasure, so long as you are a member of the library. You see yellow crystals, which are the recipe crystals. Boil a pot of water, and add a yellow crystal, and a recipe will occur. You hear brown crystals, playing their unique version of folk songs which are covers of pop songs, from the year before last, when all pop songs, were about hours, when hours were still a way to fill the day. But of course, a folk song by a brown crystal, sounds very muddled, because of the way brown crystals sing. You want to see all of the crystals, in the library, to see if there is a crystal, that can help you remove the cocoon that has consumed your hand. However, you are stuck in the doorway. The cocoon on your hand, is now as large as an observation boulder. In fact, the cocoon on your hand, is now an observation boulder. You see a clipboard, with a sign-in sheet, nailed to the boulder. You find my name written on the sign-in sheet. You see a latch, and a door, on the side of the boulder. You try to undo the latch, to open the door, but the door remains shut. You knock on the door, and I open up the observation boulder, and you see me, looking at you with binoculars, to my face. And you ask, have you been inside this cocoon? that is now an observation boulder, this entire time. And I answer, yes, I thought it would be good to observe you, as a subject, in the season of smoke, with a cocoon wrapped around your hand. And you ask, did you make good observations? And I answer, yes, I made a very good observation, and perhaps you should come inside, the observation cocoon to see my observation. And you enter the cocoon, as far as you can enter, because your hand is still trapped inside of the cocoon, in a way that your arm attached to the trapped hand, must hang out of the doorway, in an uncomfortable way. So you stand in the doorway of the cocoon, while the cocoon is trapped in the doorway of the library. You are now standing in a double doorway and anything can happen next, and this is very fortunate. Inside of the cocoon, I tell you to look. And you look, but not where I want you to look. You look out the observation window, to the catacomb of skulls, outside of the doorway of the crystal library. And you see that one of the skulls, wears a pair of sunglasses. And you ask if the skull, wearing sunglasses, was my observation. So I look out of the observation window, and I say, no that was not my observation. And then I ask, do you think that skull, was that cool in life, when the skull was inside of a head? And then you shrug your shoulders, and say, maybe the skull became cooler, in death, when the skull, became a skull. Then I say, maybe after the season of smoke, we can return to these catacombs, and become skull scientists, and interview the other skulls, to see if the skull wearing sunglasses was always so cool. Then you smile, because you would like to become, that kind of scientist. I tell you to look. And then you look, and you see the binoculars, held to my face but you do not see, what I want you to see. So I point my finger, and binoculars, to your hand, sticking out from the wall of the observation cocoon. Then you see your hand, 
it is bald in a fist. You open your hand, expecting to see the pink caterpillar that wrapped a cocoon around your hand. But instead you see a pink crystal. And you say, I think that the caterpillar turned into a crystal. And I say, I think that maybe the crystal was disguised as a caterpillar. And then I ask, do you feel full of blood? Do you feel full of so much blood that even if the sun tried to look inside of you, you think you could survive the knives of sunlight? You would not bleed into the world. And you say, I do feel full of blood. I am a lake of blood, as full of blood as a lake is full of blood. Because for the lake, all of its water is its blood, its body, and its personality. And then you say, I am as full of blood, as the cloud children are full of funny faces. And then you say, I am as full of blood, as the season of smoke, is full of smoke, and particles, and emotions. And then you are fully inside of the observation cocoon with me. Because, your hand has pulled free from the wall of the cocoon. And because, you sign your name on the sign-in sheet, on the clipboard, hanging on the outside of the observation boulder. You sit next to me, and hand me the pink crystal. And I feel full of blood, until I pass the pink crystal, back to you. So that you feel full of blood. And we continue to pass the pink crystal, back and forth between your hands, to my hands, to your hands again, while we look out the observation window, and observe our field of study. And in our field of study, is the cool skull, wearing sunglasses, in the catacomb of skulls. Until the torches of the catacombs burn out. Until a hundred years pass. And then, until a thousand years pass, and then a million more years pass. And we continue to pass the pink crystal, back and forth, between your hands, to my hands, to your hands again. And understand how the pull of the moon, and the tides of the ocean, inspired the first simple organisms of Earth, to take form, and move about the water. And then a million more years pass, and the cool skull has turned to dust, leaving behind a pair of sunglasses, which make the darkness look cool. And then the sun, finally finds us, and uses the knives of sunlight, to cut through the dream earth. To look inside of the observation cocoon, to look inside of each of us. This is fine, because we hold the pink crystal, and we are full of blood. And then we are full of sunlight. And when you feel the sunlight, and are full of sunlight, full of the sun wondering about what is inside of you, you wake up. And now you are ready, for another day. This has been the Crystal Dream, with your dream guide, friend. Dream Guides are written and recorded by Chad Redden. Find more Dream Guides and answers to Dream Questions at D R E A M G U I D dot E S and on iTunes or wherever fine podcasts are found.